All right, guys, so when last we left off, we were just showing some of the kinds of fractures you can expect when it comes to hip and pelvis x-rays. Talked a little bit about dislocation, which you see right there. And, of course, we also talked about some of the prosthesis that people have. If you remember what I said, one really key point when it comes to doing any kind of pelvis, femur, hip x-ray is if there's a prosthesis in there, in particular with the pelvis, there's a little more wiggle room on other body parts, but when it comes to the pelvis, hip, and femur, you do always... So I want to make sure you include that entire prosthesis on that x-ray. That's extremely important. If you didn't write that down last time, make sure you write that down now because that's a very key point when it comes to doing these x-rays. You always need that entire prosthesis. They're more concerned with the prosthesis than any other part of that pelvis, hip, or femur. And this is just showing you a couple more fractures here. This is a fractured femur there in the middle of the shaft. Of course, I have a very comminuted splintered fracture here on the left side. Very, very painful. This is where we would obviously have to do just plain AP on this person. And we have to opt for that Danilius Miller x-ray to get that lateral. And those of you in lab probably got to experience that Danilius Miller a little bit. That's the one I said it's kind of intimidating to people, but also very effective for getting those trauma laterals when the patient can't move their leg. Of course, we have a little compound fracture here in the middle. It's split into two little parts. And that's showing you all the way on the right how most of these femur fractures, whether it's the comminuted splintered fracture or a simple break that you see right here in the middle, they're going to put those rods and screws into that femur. Most of the time, rods will go down the shaft here to hold those pieces together so it will heal properly. They'll always put at least two. You see the crisscrossing here on the distal portion. They're always going to insert at least two of those rods to stabilize that fracture, bringing the pieces together. And a lot of times, the femur will be like you see right here in the middle. They've got to guide those little wires, those rods, down that shaft of the femur, out the tip of that breaking point, and somehow get into the tip of the breaking point here. So they'll be moving those parts around slightly, trying to line them up as best they can, putting those rods in to stabilize it with the hopes that's going to heal properly. Because obviously, you would not want those bones to heal like you see on either of these pictures. A person wouldn't be able to walk properly again. So those rods they put into the surgeries are very vital in the healing process of um, doing hip and femur surgeries. What you don't see here is a lot of times they'll also insert screws close to the trochanters all the way through the neck of the femur into the head of the femur right here. These long screws, really two or three of those as well. The ones can stabilize that femur, stabilize the fractured areas, and help that person to heal properly. Very common surgery. People break their femurs quite a bit, even though it's such a strong bone, being that longest and strongest bone in the body. People do fracture, especially elderly people, because they get osteoporosis in the hips and femur, spine, and they have all these falls, and they, of course, fracture those femurs quite a bit, also fracturing their pelvis. Complex surgeries, but pretty common, pretty common. This right here is another kind of fracture that can happen on a pelvis. What do you think is fractured there? If you're guessing pubic symphysis, you're exactly right. That is a more rare type fracture, but obviously, as you can probably imagine, very, very painful, especially if you're laying down, sitting down. There would not be a comfortable way that person could sit or lie down with a fracture of that type. So it's an extraordinarily painful fracture. And to fix that, they're actually going to put plates and screws in. And I, I have a, <clears throat> excuse me, I think I have a picture of that coming up in just a second. How can they get that fracture? Usually with falls, car wrecks is the most typical. That's showing you the same kind of fracture there from an oblique view. You've got a pubic symphysis fractured here. The superior ramus is also fractured. Once again, very painful, very uncomfortable. They're going to go in there and put plates to bring those pieces together, put screws in in the hopes that's going to heal properly so that patient can walk again. That's what it looked like right there. I thought I had it in there. So anytime there's a fracture along that broom of that pelvis, they're going to put a series of plates and screws along that pelvis. Very complex surgery, but when they do this, it's going to bring those pieces together, much like with the femur, and allow it to heal properly so that person can have a good quality of life moving forward. Well, notice they also put some plates up here in the uh, by the iliac crest and by the as is. That means they fractured that iliac lean quite a bit as well to, to move those plates in there to bring those pieces back together. Now, I've seen some pretty bad pelvises before. Some of them are so fractured and the pieces are all over the place 
And these can be very long surgeries, as you can imagine, going in there, putting all those plates and screws, bringing all the pieces back together with the hopes that they're going to heal properly from those fractures. And most of the time when it comes to these, like with the pelvis, they're going to keep these inside of them the rest of their life. They're not actually going to remove those plates or screws. It's actually going to heal in there, and they're going to keep that in there. With the femur, with those rods, they'll take the rods out after the bone has healed. But if there's any screws put in the femur, they're going to go ahead and leave those screws in there. They wouldn't, they wouldn't take the screws out. So obviously people that have had surgeries like this, they would never get, be able to get MRIs because they're actually using metal screws, rods, and plates in there, and they can actually rip that out of the person, which that actually can happen. Mistakes like that have happened, which makes taking those histories so very important. But let's get into our positioning now. Like I said last time, we have finished up with the anatomy session. Not a whole lot of anatomy, but very important anatomy. Start studying it. I'm going to send you practice images by Friday of the type of images and types of anatomy that you need to focus on. But let's start getting into our positioning. We're going to, of course, start with the femur. And when we talk about the femur, very rarely are we ever able to get one shot of the femur, at least on adults. Pediatrics, yes, but on adults, because it's such a long bone, you're typically going to do a proximal and distal femur. It's going to be, two, it's going to be a series of x-rays with overlap. So you would do a proximal distal AP view. You do a proximal and distal lateral view. Also, another type of terminology people will use besides proximal and distal, you'll hear them refer to them as upper and lower femurs. Upper and lower femurs. It's another synonymous term that can be used for those same positions. Another thing you'll also see people refer to is a lot of times on the proximal femurs, some people will call it an AP and lateral hip. And the reason for that is the positioning for the proximal femur is almost exactly the same as a lateral hip. So sometimes you'll use that terminology as well. So we're going to start with the AP mid distal femur. Let's talk about the lower portion. When we talk about the distal femur, one very key aspect is that we must include that knee joint they do go ahead and evaluate that knee joint, even though they are concerned with the femur. Much like we were doing the tip fib with that long bone, they wanted both joints. When it comes to that distal femur, we must include that joint. Now, for the AP, of course, we will be supine. This will be done lying down. We would never do a femur x-ray standing up, period. They're always lying down inside the table bucky. And one thing that's important, whenever we extend that leg straight out in front of the patient in that AP position, we do need to rotate that leg just barely, five degrees. And the reason for that is the leg will naturally oblique itself when the patient's lying flat on their back. We rotate immediately five degrees to make sure that that leg actually is in true AP position. So it's a very small, subtle thing that we have to do there, but very important at the same time, that five degree the rotation of that leg in order to put that leg into a true AP position. Now, SID will be 40 inches. In fact, every position in this chapter will be 40 inches, period. Our CR will be a perpendicular beam, no angle. That's going to go into the mid shaft of the femur. And once again, it must include that knee joint. We will be using a 14 by 17 lengthwise cassette. And as far as collimation goes, you're only going to collimate side to side or horizontally. You don't have to worry about collimating laterally because with the femur being so long, remember me saying we do want some overlap going on with the x-ray between the upper lower. So the more open collimation vertically is acceptable and wanted on those finger x-rays to get that overlap between the two x-rays so the doctor can basically stitch them together when they're doing an evaluation and see that whole femur as one image. These will always be done in the table bucky unless you're doing a mobile x-ray. It's an emergency trauma situation. The reason it needs to be in that table bucky is same with the knee and you are including the knee by the way. It's a very thick bone, very large bone, and we need that table bucky to clean it so that scatter and enhance our image. Gonadal shielding, as with everything, guys, you do want that gonadal shielding to be present on your patient, on your femur x-rays. That will change a little bit when we get to pelvis, but for femur, we're going to go ahead and always have that gonadal shielding, whether it's the upper or the lower femur, proximal or distal.
Now, what's our evaluation criteria? Quite simple, to be honest. We, of course, do want to have a true AP. If you remember, once again, how do we achieve the true AP on the distal femur? We rotate that leg, foot medially five degrees, very subtle. We must include the knee joint. If we do not, we have to do an isolated film of the knee by itself. They must have the knee. No rotation. No rotation will be achieved by having that five degree medial rotation of the leg. Now, that sounds like an oxymoron there, but we get the true AP by subtly immediately rotating that leg five degrees. And of course, our optimal exposure factors. And I will add in there, you want that good, tight, horizontal collimation. A lot of people make the mistake of leaving that 14 by 17 all the way open horizontally. You're going to include a lot of that soft tissue. Some people have some very large thighs. The more soft tissue you're including on that femur x-ray, the more that image quality is going to degrade and get worse. So use that very tight horizontal collimation along the shaft of that femur keeping that vertical collimation all the way open so that you achieve that overlap between the distal and proximal AP femur. Okay, so we're going to go to the lateral distal now. So for the lateral distal femur, we have, are still going to be lying down. Now, of course, the patient will need to roll to their side because we do want to achieve that true lateral on the femur. And there's a few things we do to make sure we get that nice true lateral. We are going to flex the knee 45 degrees, placing that leg in a true lateral, as you see right here in this picture right here. Now, there's two ways you can do it. You can do it by the method you see up here, where you have the unaffected leg behind the affected leg putting that leg in a nice true lateral, but the method I prefer is the one on the bottom, much like I told you guys with the knee. My preferred method for this distal femur is to take the unaffected leg and bring it over the affected leg to the anterior side. Now, from what I've seen, when you do that, that puts the knee in a more true lateral and removes that uh, obliquity, obliquity of those condyles, puts them more in superimposition. You can do either way. They're both considered correct, but at least in my experience, the method on the bottom, bringing that unaffected leg over, is much more effective for that distal femur because it is going to put that knee in a nice, true, beautiful lateral with the condyle superimposed. We're still at 40 inches, guys. For the central ray, it's actually in the same spot as the AP. It's a perpendicular beam at the mid shaft of that femur, and we're still including that knee joint, the entire knee joint. We're still on a 14 by 17 lengthwise. Same exact concept. We want that collimation to be all the way open vertically but tightly collimated horizontally along the shaft of that femur. And we're still only using table bucky. Clean up that scatter. It was a nice, pretty image, of course, using argonatal shielding. This is going to be your lateral distal femur. And do keep in mind in lab, guys, when you actually do your test out, so when it comes to femurs, you're not going to pick just an upper or a lower. If you pick a femur, you're going to be expected to do both the upper and the lower of the AP or the lateral. Just to keep in mind. <clears throat> now, if we had to do that as a trauma case, guys, Remember, preferably, we would, we would want to do this in the table bucky, but let's say you're in the EC, patient has a severe fracture, they can't come to the department, you got to use your mobile machine. Do the option of doing the trauma lateral medial exam. That's simply a cross-table lateral distal femur. Everything's going to be the same, with the exception that the patient is going to be lying flat on their back, and you're shooting with a horizontal beam across the table in a cross-table fashion. And that would only be for your trauma cases when that patient cannot come to the department because... This will be a less quality image. You can notice on that image, they're not even centered to the cassettes. Now, if you could get that central to the cassette, it would help. They're using a free cassette, not centered. They're basically just trying to get the best image possible because femur fractures can be quite severe, and you're not going to be able to get an optimal image necessarily on a trauma case. 
she will try to get as close to it as possible. So you'd opt for that trauma lateral medial, she can cross table across that, um, that stretcher with your mobile machine. So what's our evaluation criteria? Very simple once again. We, of course, do need the knee joint included at minimum. It must be on there, otherwise we have to do a dedicated knee film. No rotation, we do on true lateral and optimal exposure factors. Now this image here on the right, this in my opinion has a little bit too much rotation. And that's why I suggest to you bringing that unaffected leg over the affected leg for a lateral. If you do that, more often than not, you're going to get true superimposition of those femoral condyles. It's going to give you a much prettier image, much prettier image. So once again, both methods are acceptable. If you want the really pretty images, bring that unaffected leg over the affected leg for those lateral lower femurs. It's going to give you a better image of that knee overall. And then same thing I said before, guys. Once again, make sure you get that tight collision horizontally leaving it open horizontally to create that overlap for the radiologist between the upper and lower portions of that femur. Now let's talk about our AP proximal femur, the AP views uh, here of the proximal section of the femur. That's the upper portion closer to the hip. So the patient will be supine, lying flat on their back, as they should be for all APs. The leg will be extended straight out in front of the patient, and we are going to rotate the leg more than we would for the distal. This is, once again, to put that hip bone into a true AP. So for the upper femur, we're going to rotate that foot medially 15 to 20 degrees. It's a much sharper angulation, a much sharper obliquity than with the distal femur. So don't mix those up. It's an easy thing people mix up. Distal femur, we immediately rotate 5 degrees. Proximal femur, we immediately rotate 15 to 20 degrees. Now, of course, we're still at 40 inch SID. When it comes to the CR, it's still going to be considered at the mid shaft of the femur, but we're going to include the hip joint this time. That's very vital in comparison to the distal. Distal, we need knee joints. Proximal, we must have the hip joints, the complete hip joint, including all the acetabulum, by the way. We're still on that 14 by 17 lengthwise, collimating sharply horizontally, but leaving that vertical collimation wide open, because once again, we are creating overlap between those two APUs. Still on the table, Bucky, preferably, and of course, gonadal shielding on all of our patients. Main thing to remember, guys, put a big circle around that. Make sure you know the difference between the AP and, the, I'm sorry, the proximal and distal. Proximal, we rotate the foot or rotate the leg 15 to 20 degrees. Distal, we rotate only 5 degrees. And that's to put that leg, that femur, into a true AP in both those views. If we don't, it's actually going to be more oblique. This is the way the patient naturally lies on that table. So usually you can achieve that by just simply taking the patient's foot, guys, and rotating the foot 15 to 20 degrees. That's going to rotate that whole leg. And that's what your AP proximal femur would look like. A little bit of the anatomy we've went over, including that fovea capitis. I'm sorry, that image is a little blurry. Try to find more HD image of this exact one here. This is a case of where that patient was positioned properly, they use good exposure techniques, and you can actually view the fovea capitis on the x-ray. I know you can't see that because it's kind of blurry. But of course, we have all this other wonderful anatomy. We have our femoral head, femoral neck, intertrochanter and crest going down the middle here, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, and our femoral shaft. Do keep in mind, if I give you a femur x-ray, we've got all this, all this anatomy that we can identify as well. There is a lot of overlap between those exams. Do remember, if we're looking at an AP view, predominantly that greater trochanter is visualized in profile with the lesser trochanter almost completely hidden on our AP views. So 
So what's our evaluation criteria for that AP? Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the evaluation criteria on the AP proximal. I want to add that slide in, guys. I apologize. I'm missing two slides here. Well, you know what, guys? That's actually a good indication that I need to stop anyway because I've actually got in class 30 minutes early today. I've got to go up to Kirby for a meeting with Dr. Black and the rest of the faculty. Um, we'll stop here at AP Proximal Femur. i got to add those slides back in anyway. I don't want you to miss that information because it's very important. We'll pick right back up on Friday with AP Proximal Femur, and we'll get through a lot of the pelvis positions as well. Are there any questions about what we talked about today? I know we didn't go over a lot today, but we're going to hit it even harder on Friday. All right. So we'll enjoy your little bit of extended afternoon, guys. Thank you for your projects. Good job on that. Look forward to looking at them closer on my phone, and I'll announce the winner on that on Friday. Everyone have a spectacular afternoon, and I will see you guys very soon. Bye-bye.